We're now going to look at um, the chapter from the um, Scott Ray text that deals with physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. Because I know you're good students, I'm going to, going to uh, uh, just touch on some of the high points. Please be sure you've done your good reading on all these things. They're very, very worthwhile. We'll see that an important study was made to show that <clears throat> how to affect the perceived welfare of the patient who is going through a terminal illness is difficult, problematic. Some people who get the best care end up still not being very, uh, very pleased, and others that have not um, end up uh, achieving a certain amount of satisfaction. So how to determine what should be done, what is our requirement, needs to be uh, dependent upon something else than only an individual's uh, subjective perception of his own well-being. That doesn't mean we take the control away from that individual. We do not want to become paternalistic in this. That the doctors always know best. That's paternalism. But we also recognize that um, there are factors that need to be considered by varieties of different people uh, about what those steps should be. So the termination of life support, or TLS, is one of the questions that's being looked at in this chapter. When I use the word euthanasia, I'm referring to an action taken without which the patient would still be alive. So it could be poison. It could be, um, you know, a pistol to the, to the head. Uh, a variety of things could be termed euthanasia. The important thing to recognize is we're not talking about letting life follow its course here. Some people have called that letting life follow its course, terminating <coughs> extraordinary measures, <coughs> as passive euthanasia. Now remember in the last section I said we had a problem with confusing definitions. That's not euthanasia at all. That is simply allowing that person to refuse extraordinary measures without which they could be kept alive. But it's not the same as the action without which that person would still be alive. Because euthanasia is tantamount to putting a gun to a patient's head. And when you pull the trigger, it's that pulling of the trigger that has resulted in that patient's death, not their illness. And that makes it a little bit more clear. When we talk about euthanasia, I'm not in favor of it. But I am in favor of awareness about options and the decision to decide to not treat. Dying patients want to know the truth. They want to, know it, want to have it communicated to them in a timely and regular way. And dying patients and their families want to be regarded as a decision-making unit so that physicians and others are not thinking they can pit one group against another. Surviving family needs time for taking care of unfinished relational business. This is one argument against euthanasia. Patients and families want to be forewarned that their end of life is near. It's also important to recognize what constitutes informed consent. And I would su submit that a person in the throes of a, of a terminal illness may very well not be competent to provide informed consent. They're under duress. They see no other options. They're feeling deep pain, uh, unremitting pain perhaps. And others probably will need to be uh, <clears throat> consulted. Dying patients and families want advanced directives discussed and followed. Physicians and nurses need, need to agree that they have lack of education on the care of the dying. They need to be pressured uh, to, to watch the pace of their practice. Because sometimes the rushing and the moving of a, of a patient down an assembly line of different services dehumanizes that person. I've encountered that myself as I've seen my wife being waked up to take a sleeping pill and waked up at 3 a.m. because that happens to be when the doctor was there. Sometimes patients often feel inadequate and distance themselves. I mean, physicians often feel inadequate and they distance themselves from dying patients and their families. So these are areas where Christians can be uh, influential. Death and dying in a theological perspective. Human life is a sacred gift from God. Innocent human life is not to be taken. The obligation is for us to protect the most vulnerable in our society. 
Death came as a result of the entrance of sin into the world, Romans 5.12. 1 Corinthians 15.21-22. Death is not part of God's original design, but death is a normal part of a person's life under the sun. Ecclesiastes teaches us there is a time to die. Death is both an enemy and it's also a part of life. Now, Paul said in Romans in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Exulting, as it were, in death as a conquered enemy. So if death is a conquered enemy, and its full sting is taken away by the sacrifice of Christ and by the promised resurrection of the dead, then death need not always be resisted. Doctors don't always need to do everything in their power. When the prognosis is poor and further treatment is futile, death can be welcomed as the, as the doorstep to eternity. Death can be something that makes what is left of life uh, uh, more useful. And if, if we recognize that uh, we can help in easeful dying, as the Christian ethicist Arthur Dyke mentioned, easeful dying, uh, we may be, make a real big impact. Withholding or withdrawing life support, uh, sustaining treatment, when a, when a competent patient requests it, or when it is futile, or when the burdens outweigh the benefits, seems to be an ethical action. <clears throat> For discussion, uh, no, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll skip that one, talking about Art Buckwald and refusing treatment that would have kept him alive. So did James Michener, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, dialysis patient who just got tired of having dialysis. And he said, I'm in my 70s, I had a worthwhile life, I just choose to not have dialysis anymore. I know it will result in my sooner death. Um, <clears throat> it seems like that's the element of autonomy that in the right mind is, is something that we, can, uh, that we can allow. If we remove life support, or we, do we feel like we're playing God? or killing our loved one. And if we've not taken all the precautions to be sure that A, they've, they approve, and secondly, that they feel that they're able to pass into eternity in full conscience, um, then I would say we're not killing. We're allowing life to finish. Now, what about when you starve somebody? This is a different issue. Because we need food and we need water to live. We're not talking about extraordinary measures here. We're talking about ordinary measures. We're not talking about exotic treatments that may or may not work. We're talking about if we don't feed a person, they're going to die. If we don't give them water, they're going to die. Uh, there are some circumstances in which giving a patient a meal actually increases their pain. I've learned that from some nurses. But in most situations, it's not approved to, t to withhold food and hydration. Because uh, that would be altering the natural course in a, in a very arbitrary way. The Hippocratic Oath says never give a, a patient a poison to allow them to kill themselves. And so all doctors who have signed the Hippocratic Oath are duty bound to never uh, end the life of a patient. One of our biggest problems that we encounter is the problem of empowering life givers to be death dealers. And this is a mental schizophrenia that will result as we empower doctors to administer death dealing measures. I think we need to stand against that. I think we need to pray for wisdom and compassion that we might give the comfort that is needed. Uh, he, is the God of, he is the God of all comfort. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. May the Lord help us.